Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Institut Montaigne, virtually. Uh, today's webinar could not be more timely. The Italian government has just been formed, and President Macron has just met Giorgia Meloni for the first place, for the first time in, in Italy. And, and these recent developments uh, need to be deciphered, uh, interpreted. Uh, and nobody is better placed than Marc Lazar and Eric Chanet for doing it for us and to make sense of the direction in which Italy is going critically as well as economically. Let me introduce you people who do not need any introduction briefly. Marc Lazar is Emeritus Professor at the History Center at Sciences Po and the co confner with me of the Observatory of Populism and of course, foremost specialist of Italy. Eric Chanet has been economic advisor to Institut Montaigne since 2017, and before that, between 2008 and 2016, he was the chief economist of AXA for its worldwide activities. Mark will speak first, introducing uh, the subject, very topical indeed, and uh, Eric will follow immediately, focusing more, of course, on the economic dimension of today's trajectory uh, of Italy. After that, we'll have more than 30 minutes for Q&A. So if you want to ask a question, to make a comment, uh, just raise your hand uh, and you will be in a position to ask your question, to make your comment um, orally. If you want also to use the chat box, you're most welcome to do it and to exchange ideas uh, via this uh, other a way to interact on Zoom, something we are very much used to uh, now. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Christophe, and uh, uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, I'm going to speak on the political aspects of this uh, Italy uh, of today. I will stress different points. The first point will be some elements of reflection about the composition of this government. Uh, the second point is going to be uh, some words about what can do this government for Italy in, in terms of domestic policy. Uh, the third point will be the relationship uh, uh, between this government, this new government with the European Union. And, uh, uh, and the last point will be which kind of relationship we can think it's going to be uh, uh, created between France and uh, between Italy and France. So how is this government? Uh, I think the first point, it's a really Georgia Meloni's government. I mean, her personal government. Uh, the negotiations uh, with the partners of Brothers of Italy, which is the party of Georgia Meloni, the League and Forza Italia have been complicated, but she decided alone the choice of the minister. Salvini, for instance, wanted to come back at the uh, Ministry of uh, Interior and he failed. Uh, Silvio Berlusconi wanted to put someone close to him uh, to the Ministry of Justice and Meloni refused. So that's really an important point. And uh, this important, important point, this personal government, is linked to the real personal leadership uh, of Georgia Meloni. Uh, I remember uh, her party won 26% at the, at the elections of September, uh, which means 17% percent of the electors, and this is an important point because there was a high level of abstention. It's an incredible progress uh, from uh, the 4% of the last election in 2018. So it's a high result. But we have some polls now that uh, demonstrate she has a real personal leadership. In a poll which has been published yesterday by uh, Ilvo Diamanti, one of the most important sociologists of Italy, which has been published by uh, the newspapers La Repubblica, we see that she has 53% of support by the Italians, 53%. So uh, we have to be careful with this data because we know that in Italy we, we have recurrent moments uh, because of the deep uh, political instability of this country because of the high level of distrust, uh, the Italians are looking for a kind of savior 
of the nation, of the country, and sometimes they support a leader which is emerging. And after when they are disappointed, immediately they, uh, these leaders lose the support. It has been the case for Berlusconi. It has been the case for uh, Matteo uh, Renzi uh, recently. But it's sure that she has a real political leadership. It's a government. And uh, uh, obviously we have to uh, understand that we are living in Italy, a historical event. She is the first woman to be uh, the first minister. She is a woman who has been a fascist, but who now is leading a country who has an anti-fascist constitution. We are very lucky to have this uh, seminar, this uh, session today, because this morning, Giorgia Meloni had uh, did a speech of uh, the parliament uh, to have the trust and the voters for the vote of the parliament. And she had a very long speech. And I would like uh, to uh, quote something which is very important. I quote, I have never felt any sympathy or closeness to anti-democratic regime for no regime, fascism included. In the same way, I have always considered the anti-Semitic racial loaves of 1938 the lowest point of Italian history. A shame, a shame that will taint our people forever. So from one part she lies because she was a real fascist, but it's a real turning point uh, because she wants to demonstrate that now fascist experience is over. Uh, the second point of this government, uh, it's a, a real uh, element of reflection about the balance of power inside the coalition of so-called coalition center right, which is now a right center coalition. The government is composed of 26 ministers who are waiting for the nomination of the Secretary di Stato, Secretaries of State. But for the moment, 26 ministers, nine from Bozos of Italy, five for Forza Italia, five for the League, and the five other are what we used to call in Italy uh, technician, minister, technician minister, but all of them more or less close to Georgia Meloni. It's a government with six women, so there is no equality. Uh, in the Draghi's government, there were only eight women, but this is less now, six women. Uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, on 26 minister, 15 are coming from the north of the country. And this is very important for Italy because it demonstrates the will of Georgia Meloni to have a, a strong relationship with the north of the country, because at the elections of the uh, September 25, she had a, a, a real progression in the north of the country, the richest part of the country, and she is now the first party in the north of the country. Uh, when we see this government, we could say that it's a government with a double face. Uh, the first face is the face of the responsibility. Uh, responsibility for the markets, for the European Union, for uh, Paris, for Berlin, for Washington. Uh, minister responsible uh, are the Minister of Economy and Finance. She tried to have a technician. She asked to many of them, members of the Bank of Italy, all those technicians and people with a high level of reputation, all of them refused to uh, be member of this government, but she had uh, minister, his name is Giorgetti, Giancarlo Giorgetti, which is member of the League, but the moderate component of the League, and who was member of the government of Mario Draghi. So uh, a government that she criticized because she was at the opposition, uh, but she decided to have this Giorgetti, who has a very good fame in international fame, has a real experience of government. Uh, face of responsibility also for the foreign minister, uh, for the minister of European affairs and the PNRR, who has to, uh, to follow uh, the national plan for uh, the reliance and resiliation, which means next generation EU. Uh, good minister also for the defense, uh, uh, his name is Guido Crosetto, which means that uh, with this important minister, it's a, 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 a real symbolic uh, and political choice to uh, other capitals, to the international, to the European level, 
to demonstrate the sense of responsibility of Georgia Meloni. But there is a, a second phase. And the second phase is more uh, linked to the ideological project of Georgia Meloni. She is a post-fascist. She is a radical member of the radical right. She is a nationalist. She is a conservative. And we have a real right government uh, with some uh, minister who change of appellation of nomination. And that's very interesting to uh, follow that. For instance, the Ministry of Agriculture now is Ministry, Ministry of, Agri of Agriculture and uh, uh, Alimentary Sovereignty, as in France. Uh, there is a Minister uh, of Public Instruction, but now it's a Ministry of Public Instruction and of the Merit. Uh, we had by the past a Minister of European uh, uh, um, of European development, and now it's Ministry of Firms and of Made in Italy. Made in Italy. Uh, there is a Minister of Family and of the Natality. So that's very interesting to see, for instance, the two last minister, uh, Minister of Firms and Made in Italy. Uh, the Made in Italy was present in the program of Brothers of Italy. It's a, a reference to the prestige of the brand made in Italy. It's supposed also uh, in my mind to indicate an element of national proudness and it could suggest uh, the future policy of protectionism. Always in the speech of this morning, she say, for instance, uh, Melanie said she is in favor, I quote, for a safeguard of the national interest for the conditions of public infrastructure, such as highways and airports. I'm quite sure, for instance, that uh, for the future of the Italian airline, ETR, that uh, uh, Draghi wanted to have an alliance with France, I'm quite sure that she will block that because she will try to save the national uh, airline company. Uh, the Ministry of Family and Natality and Equality uh, Opportunities. Uh, this is a priority for Melanie because she would like to uh, um, change uh, the decrease of the natality uh, in Italy. But this is a very interesting point. But uh, the minister she chose is a pro-life activist against the abortion, even if uh, this new minister is a very clever woman who was by the past when she was young, an activist uh, uh, feminist. She changed completely and she is now a minister of family and uh, natality. Very important to see the use of the words by Georgia Meloni, not only for the appellation and the denomination of the ministries, but also in all the speech she does. For instance, she does not speak anymore as all the other politicians of the country, il paese. She speaks always of the nation. So uh, it's a, a, an indication of, in my mind, it's an indication of a, a, an attempt to create a cultural hegemony, which uh, supposed to have a, another language. Uh, with Melanie, we could say that uh, she tries to do um, uh, something more or less equivalent uh, with Trump's slogan. Uh, let's make Italy great again. That could be, you know, uh, the expression of Georgia Meloni. This is the first point about the reflections about the composition of the government. What the government will do in Italy? Uh, the emergency, and she said that during a speech of this morning uh, in, uh, for the Chamber of the Deputies, uh, is obviously to write the financial law and to have the budget. A, a, a beginning of the budget has been uh, done by Mario Draghi, but she will have to finalize uh, 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 the budget. Uh, and she insists about that. Eric is going to speak about this topic, but I will just say uh, one word. Uh, when we see the program of Georgia Meloni, it's a more or less a mixture between some liberal uh, attitudes and proposition. Let's reduce the tax. And she repeated that this morning, we're going to reduce uh, the tax uh, uh, for the firms, for the families, uh, uh, and many things like that to facilitate, to uh, help uh, the business uh, to have a big activity, uh, reducing all the rules, for instance, to have a more efficient business. But on the same moment, she speaks also of social proposition, 
for instance, for the support of the natality, for the social protection for craftsmen and shopkeepers, uh, for measures for uh, 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 the fuel uh, 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 and the gas for uh, all the Italian families. And she say also that, I quote this morning, she wants to encourage early retirement, but in the respect of the pension system, very complicated to resolve. Uh, and uh, obviously, Eric is going to uh, speak about that. Uh, um, my uh, hypothesis uh, is that the government, the Italian government, will have a very limited capacity of action on economics for different reasons, and especially for uh, the public debt. Uh, and again, Eric is going to speak about that. So, if she cannot do so, if she cannot do many things on the European level, I think that she try to do other things on other subjects. What are these subjects? Migrants and immigration, and uh, questions of uh, 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 security day by day. And she said uh, during the campaign, and she said again this morning, that we have to prevent the arrivals of migrants uh, with a European policy in favor of Africa, for Africa, and with the creation of hotspots on North African coast. Uh, she will try to do a policy for the natality, uh, helping families with children, and for instance, giving money, not anymore for the association for the abortion, but for pro-life association. Uh, she will try to do some things uh, about uh, protectionism, uh, and especially for some companies. Uh, I think also that with the Ministry of Education, she will try to do something in the program of Bozas of Italy. It's a right in that it's a necessity to have other books of history for schools and high school with a more space for the national great historical leaders of Italy. Maybe it will be Mussolini, maybe it will be Cavour, I don't know. Uh, but she would like to write new history book. Uh, uh, but the main point, and it was very clear in the speech of this morning, uh, is to go and to try to change the constitution on the key point, which is uh, the elections of the president of the Republic uh, by the Italians, a direct election of the French model, with many problems because uh, it's supposed to have the majority of two thirds of the parliament. She has not for the moment, but maybe she could hope to have a support for other deputies, not of the center, not only of the center right. If not, she will organize a referendum, but she said and repeated very clearly this morning, we will do this reform because she has to compensate what she cannot do on the economic fields with this kind of action. What is uh, Italy, what the government is going to do uh, with the European Union? I will not speak about economic, that will be uh, Eric who is going to speak and what can the government, what could do the government and especially for the revision of the next generation EU. Uh, she said that there is a necessity because of the situation of the war and because of the situation of energetic crisis to have a revision of some elements of the next generation European Union. What are exactly the points of discussion? That will be a great interrogation. Uh, I think, and I re she repeated uh, again this morning that she's a pro-European Union, but I think that the, really the crucial point, really the crucial point will be to, ex to see how Rome is going to position inside the European Union. Uh, Will she, does she, I don't know if she's going to choose, for instance, to be closer than before uh, of the Polish government, for instance, and the Hungarian government. With the Hungarian government, there is a problem because Orban is pro-Russian and she's against Russia. But does she, for instance, is she able to do an alliance with uh, uh, Poland? That will be really the great question. What will be the relationship between Italy and France? It's not going to be very easy, that's sure, because uh, Melanie does not like France and French people, that's absolutely sure. She criticized a lot in 2018 Emmanuel Macron, hardly. She had the first meeting, as Christophe said. Uh, it seems that it has been a, not a good relationship, but a, a realistic relationship between the President of the Republic and the President of the Council. 
I think there is a very big gap between uh, the government of Macron and the government of Meloni. Uh, we will have some polemics, that's absolutely sure, in the next weeks and months. But I think that we have some points of convergence uh, between the two countries. War in Ukraine, we are more or less the same position. Uh, the criteria of Maastricht, there is this uh, great will of French and Italian government to have more flexibility for the public debt. Uh, the questions uh, of energy, I think uh, we could have a, a real convergence between Paris and one on that point. And uh, maybe, maybe the policy of migrants, which has been a, a, a subject of disagreement between uh, France and in Italy. It will be a less enthusiastic relationship than it was between Macron and Mario Draghi. It will be maybe a more realistic uh, relationship uh, with, again, some moments of parliament. Just to conclude, uh, Melanie is in a good position for the moment. She won the election. She has a high level of popular, a quite high level of popularity. And the great chance she has, the opposition is divided. So she has really a possibility to govern. She has also elements of weakness. We know perfectly that the, the coalition is very divided, especially on the war on Ukraine. Berlusconi and Salvini are against the sanctions, against uh, uh, the fact to uh, send weapons and arms to Ukrainian people. Melanie again this morning said, we will always do the same policy as Mario Draghi did for the Ukrainian people. So it will be a permanent guerrilla between Forza Italia and League from one part and Georgia Meloni on the other part. Does it mean that the government will fail very quickly as some uh, many Italians of the opposition hope? I'm not so sure for two main reasons. Uh, the first one, there is a real aspiration of the voters of right in Italy to remain in power by hostility to the left. Since 2011, they are at the opposition. Now they are in power. And there is a kind of pressure by the voters to have always the unity of the so-called center-right coalition. This is an important point. There is a kind of pressure, of pressure coming from the voters. And the second point, I'm sure, that Meloni, uh, for Meloni, it's something which is absolutely incredible, unbelievable to be in power now. She was at four persons. She has always been, a party has always been uh, marginalized and now they are in power. So she wants to remain in power. So she would like, I think she has a real project. And what is this project? Is to build a, to build a great radical right party taking the voters which remain at the League and Forza Italia to build a real conservative and a radical right party as the two models she has. And what are these two models? First, the Republican Party in USA, and the second, the Likud in Israel. Uh, uh, and that's the point. So the problem for her, that will be to find the good uh, balance uh, between the necessary necessary compromise she will have to do with the allies and this political strategy she has in mind. I uh, uh, stop here, uh, Christophe. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for this very comprehensive assessment of the political situation and the future scenarios uh, in terms of policies, especially. Let, let's turn now to Eric, Eric Chenet for analyzing the, the economics. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Christophe, and thank you, Mark, for inviting me. I'm very happy to, to try to, to figure out what, what is going on in the Italian economy. Uh, but you see that I have a big jumper. It's because in my alpine height, that's very cold. But next to where I am, there is a beautiful mountain named Sant'Elena. It was called saint Helene a very long time ago, but now it's saint Helena. so I'm really next to the border of Italy. I'm going to, uh, to try to elaborate on three points. The first one is uh, the state of the Italian economy, which uh, in one word is very bad. The second will be about the new government of Mrs. Meloni and what we know of its economic program. And I would say 
so far, so good. And my third point will be about uh, the financial markets. Uh, because we had this incredible uh, episode in the UK with uh, Liz Truss uh, announcing a, a, an extravagant fiscal policy and the punishment came from the market uh, almost immediately. Uh, the markets are very important in the case of Italy. And I would say that uh, as far as the markets are concerned, it's a very benign and I would say even slightly positive reaction so far. So let's start with the economy, uh, which is uh, extremely worrisome. Uh, Italy is, uh, together with Greece, uh, the only country in the Eurozone where uh, in real income per capita is lower today, on average, than it was before joining the Euro. Uh, and this is uh, something which is, uh, which is terrible, because the Euro was supposed to help economies uh, to, to live you know, better. Uh, escaping the, the devaluations that Italy, France, Spain, Portugal, and other countries were condemned to. And uh, that was also supposed to help uh, structural reforms. And uh, I have to say that uh, in this regard, Italy is, is, has been quite disappointing. There, there are very structural factors, such as the demography of the country, uh, but it cannot be the only explanation. Um, uh, everybody's talking about the size of the public debt, and that is a real issue. Uh, before joining the euro, Italy managed to cut slightly its debt uh, by a, a fantastic, uh, I would say, tour de passe-passe, which was to raise a special levy and to pay it back once Italy would be uh, admitted into the euro area. But the debt of the country, the public debt of the country was, I would say, relatively low. It was around 110% of GDP, which was far above the 60%, but it was going down. Now, the public debt is at more than 150% of GDP. I'm taking uh, my data from the BIS. It's 153%. But here is the issue. When one looks at the indebtedness of the country, which is the public sector and the private sector, the private sector being households, which are mostly indebted for their housing uh, purchases, and companies. I give you the numbers. Uh, the aggregate debt, so all sectors put together in Italy is 276% of GDP. That sounds high. It is not. For the euro area, it is 273%. For the US, it is 275%. So Italy is right in the middle of the developed countries of the euro area or the US as far as the aggregate debt is concerned. So this is evidence that in Italy, the public debt has crowded out the private debt. And the fact is that the indebtedness of Italian companies is extremely low. It is 71% of GDP. Uh, in France, it is 160% uh, of GDP. Well, France is a bit extreme in this regard. But is that good news? Well, it's good news for companies when interest rates are going up, which is the case now. But what does it mean from a structural standpoint? It means that the banking system is not strong enough to lend to companies in Italy and that the government is taking all the room in terms of borrowing. And things are even worse than uh, what the numbers are saying. Because of the high level of debt, the government has reduced spending over the years on anything that can boost a potential growth, which is infrastructures, so that is interesting that Mrs. Meloni was talking about bridges and highways, but it's not only bridges and highways, education, and uh, the things that are supposed to raise productivity in the long term. So this is the catch-22. Because the public debt is so high, the government does not have the means to spend money. So that's a, that is a paradox, because debt is very high, but the government does not spend money. Most of the money goes to social transfers, 
like in many Euro area economies, starting with France, but also a huge uh, pack of money is going to uh, debt servicing. And with the rise of bond yields of long-term interest rates, which is a global phenomenon, it's not only Italy, this will uh, become even tighter in terms of the balance between what the government has to spend, which is basically taxpayers' money, uh, on debt servicing and what the government can spend to uh, improve its economy. And that is going to be, I think, one of the biggest challenges for Mrs. Meloni. The situation is very different from what it was for Draghi or even for the previous governments, because these governments were enjoying extremely low interest rates. This is no more the case. Um, now, turning to uh, what we know of uh, the new government in terms of its uh, economic program. Uh, as Mark was saying, the, the most important thing in the short term is the budget. It's the fiscal law. Uh, a, a big question to which markets have already <laughs> given uh, an answer, but you know, the markets can change their mind uh, on a dime. That, that can happen in one hour. Uh, the, the fact that the budget started with uh, Mario Draghi and that the process is going to continue. If, of course, the budget will be different, but the very fact that there is already a foundation was taken positively by the markets. And to be honest, the constraints on the Italian budget are so high because of the size of the debt, because of the level of interest rates, I will come back to this, and because of uh, the pressure coming from uh, the European Commission, from Germany, and from the other Euro area economies, the, let's say, the degrees of freedom for the Italian budget are extremely limited. So from what I understand, item number one will be the same in Italy as it is everywhere in Western Europe. It will be to reduce, to mitigate, uh, the, the, the impact of very high inflation on the purchasing power of consumers who happen also to be voters. And this is going to be extremely costly, I repeat, everywhere. The country which is going to spend the most money to protect its consumers and its companies is Germany. Germany has the means to do that because the debt is low and there is a, a lot of, of, uh, of margins for the budget. But Italy will spend probably less money than Germany, less than France, but Italy will spend money and nobody will have anything to say about that because everybody is doing the same thing. One point that uh, I understand that Mario Draghi has pushed very hard before uh, resigning was uh, to uh, get an agreement from the other Euro area countries or governments to have a common funding for precisely um, the, to cope with the energy shock, whether it is to purchase energy at very high prices, whether it is to compensate consumers, uh, that, that there was this idea to, to have a special fund which would be funded uh, on, on a collective basis, so with a joint and several liabilities, and uh, this idea was to some extent um, taken by Germany, but in a very, very limited fashion. And I'm afraid that uh, this is not going to happen. You would need to have a strong, uh, let's say, coalition of Southern countries with France, Italy, uh, and Spain pushing in this direction. So a strong political agreement to, to go in this direction. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that this is going to happen. So Italy will spend money, but less than countries which are in a better fiscal position, such as Germany. And this is certainly going to raise political questions because it will be not enough uh, to compensate for the, the, the energy shock, which is quite significant for Italy, simply because Italy is much more dependent on A, fossil gas, B, fossil gas from Russia. Italy does not have a lot of renewable, hydro, does not have any nuclear power, which is uh, a pity these times. So that will make, uh, I think, uh, things uh, quite difficult for the government and for the Italian population. My main concern is really Italian companies. 
uh, if Italy uh, uh, is always, uh, you know, Italy is a, is a story. The Italian economy is a story of uh, everybody thinks it's going to sink, and suddenly you discover that it is uh, reborn, it is born again. And that is the dynamism of Italian companies, SMEs, which are not always that small. They are also big companies in Italy. Maybe they are concentrated in the north, northern part of Italy, but this is really uh, the best, uh, 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 this is the best chance of Italy. It is its companies. So the fact that interest rates are going up and that the indebtedness of Italian companies is low is good news. But the fact that the government debt is now higher than it was before makes the crowding out of the public debt on potential indebtedness of the private sector, starting with companies, even more important. And that, that, is, that is a way. I think uh, one of the key things um, to look at as far as the Italian economy is concerned will be the balance sheet of the banks. The banks are hit by the rise in bond yields. In the end, it's good news for banks in the long term because of course they, they, they borrow at low rates and they lend at higher rates. But in the short term, they have a lot of assets which are losing their value because bond yields are rising. So that, that will be a key point. And uh, I will look very carefully uh, in the Italian budget at anything linked to the banks. Now, the second uh, uh, point will be on structural reforms. And honestly, uh, I don't know what to say about that. Listening to Mrs. Meloni, she does not really give me the impression to be a liberal pro-market uh, uh, ready to go further on the very difficult path of structural reforms that Mario Draghi had started uh, to implement. It's not that easy. Uh, it's, it's difficult everywhere uh, to make the labor market more efficient, to make uh, the civil service more efficient. But this is of utmost importance for Italy where productivity is not growing at all. So these structural reforms are critical for the long term. And there is a loop between long term and short term. If you start the process of reforms, markets become more positive, and that makes the funding of companies easier. So I don't know what to say. I just give you my impression, my impression, but Mark will uh, hopefully correct me, uh, that the structural reforms that Draghi had on his agenda are more or less going to be on the back burner. Third point, market reaction, and that's really the good news. Um, after the uh, when Mario Draghi resigned, that was taken as as a as a big uh, shock by the financial markets. The spread between um, bond yields in Italy and Germany widened considerably, and now that we have this new government, that we know that this government is pro-euro, is pro-European Union, is pro-NATO. Th that is important because these questions uh, do matter quite a lot for for the markets. All that has been taken by the financial markets as, okay, maybe this government is more on the right side, is more conservative, but nothing will really change in terms of uh, the, the, the big checks and balances within the European Union as far as Italy is concerned. Italy is not going to spoil the game. Italy is not going to go to a Euro crisis. A very small country, Greece, was able to, uh, let's say, to fragilize the euro area as a whole. So you think what would happen if Italy had a government, you, everybody remembers what was in the platform of Cinque Stelle, for instance, but this government is very reasonable. So the market reaction is bond yields have fallen by 50 basis points. Of course, they are too high given the growth rate of Italy, but the markets so far consider that uh, the Italian economy is going to, to muddle through. May, maybe that will not be big, there will not be big reforms, but there is, I don't feel any anxiety about the budget, but of course I have to be cautious because as I said, the markets can change their mind on a dime. If the budget, if there are bad surprises in the budget, the markets might, uh, 
play the role that they played in the UK. But the only thing that I, I saw in the budget, apart from, uh, not from the budget, but from what Mrs. Melanie uh, uh, said, big spending to protect consumers and companies, okay, but how will it be funded? And there is this miracle, which happens in Italy every uh, four or five years, there will be a tax amnesty to convince people to bring back their savings, which are uh, in, in Switzerland or elsewhere, and benefit from a tax amnesty. But of course, uh, there will be nevertheless a tax. Tax amnesty means that there will be less taxes than uh, it should be. Uh, this has been used uh, many, many times in Italy, and it's amazing to see that it still works, which shows that Italians or some Italians are very rich. So because this is something that has already been used many times, again, it is taken by the markets as, okay, we know the ground on which this new government is playing, and it's it's not going to be fantastic, but it's probably going to work. I will stay here for the time being. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, the economic scene is clearly not favorable, and the government's room for maneuver appears to be very limited, but it could have been worse. And, and, and the market's reaction reflect the relatively moderate, you, you, you may even say reasonable, not so anti-EU. Uh, profile of the of the new government. Great. Well, we have plenty of time for the discussion, so I invite everyone to raise its his or her hand and to um, ask in the chat any question or ask for um, the mic uh, to be open for asking the question. I will myself initiate the, the, the conversation by, by asking two questions uh, to each of the uh, uh, speakers today. Um, Mark, uh, this making of a new party, uh, 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 an Italian version of the Likud, an Italian version of the uh, Republican Party, um, can it be something the French emulate also? This make this 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 bringing together of extreme right and 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 and, and fractions of of the right, can it be seen in France as something that may be a, a, a new model, a, a relevant model? And precisely, my second question would be about um, France. Who will be the best friends of Meloni in France if not Macron? Uh, who uh, and uh, uh, of course uh, the comparison with with Le Pen comes to mind, Marine Le Pen, but uh, they move maybe closer to her in in in, in terms. So how do you see that? And and a footnote to conclude um, my series of questions: uh, this migration policy, odd spots on the African coast, how will that work? How, how, what, what is the mechanism there? Because this is really something I had never heard of before, and uh, it would be very interesting to see how, how that uh, can be implemented. Um, Eric, just one question, because in fact, Mark had initiated the conversation on, on protectionism, and, and you did not really return to the topic. I think it could be interesting to, to see how far can Italy be protectionist uh, beyond discourses? What, what, what form can, can, can this take? And, uh, and um, well, I'll stop there because I think it's better to, to open the conversation. I see Louise has a question and uh, you can maybe just open your mic for that, Louise. Yes, hello everyone. Thank you for this discussion. Um, I don't know if this is the right space to ask this question, but I guess I'm curious about the relationship between gender and populism, uh, because despite being the first female prime minister of Italy, uh, Meloni is also arguably the least feminist one, quote unquote. And so I'm also thinking of parallels with France and Marine Le Pen, or how a lot of women in 2016 voted for Trump. Uh, we know then Trump, uh, sorry, Le Pen in France, like kind of softened her image uh, to look to have it look less like the Law and Order Party. And I know uh, Meloni campaigned a lot on being like a mother, a woman, a Christian, etc. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this. And also, do we know um, the percentage of women uh, that voted for for Meloni? Um, yeah, just um, any reactions to that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. So I, I suggest we, we take this first round of questions uh, 
Mark, will you start for offering responses? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Christophe. Um, yes, uh, what, I don't think there is a made in Italy in politics. Uh, Melanie is for made in Italy, but I don't think she is. Uh, she, I don't think there is a, a, a let's say like that an automatic political made in Italy. Uh, but uh, um, I, I think that for the moment uh, there is uh, uh, there is not a complete agreement between Marine Le Pen and Georgia Meloni on that point because uh, uh, because of the political system of Italy because of the electoral law because of this experience of coalitions of center right which is now right center because of the predominance of Bozos of Italy inside the coalition uh, we have they have in Italy this system of uh, uh, let's say right uh, united of the right uh, which is not uh, it does not exist for the moment in France and uh, uh, after the elections of the uh, 25 September uh, uh, we saw immediately that Marine Le Pen say we don't have the same uh, model uh, it, it, we don't with the cases the French case and the Italian case are different because the project of Marine Le Pen is really to be uh, you know the main party of the right she does not want to do a coalition and to be hegemonic inside the coalition on the opposite it was a project of Eric Zemmour and Marion Maréchal and it's always uh, their project to do a, a unity of the right and uh, uh, for the moment uh, Marine Le Pen, when she uh, just after 25 September, she sent uh, a, a message of uh, uh, solidarity with Matteo Salvini more than uh, Giorgia Meloni. Obviously, she uh, uh, she with, she uh, does some reference uh, to the Italian government, and she did uh, uh, recently to explain that you know what has she say the patriots now can win not only can win but can govern. And that will be uh, an element uh, of uh, reflection for the future, is a sense that um, uh, I think that we have a new, uh, uh, maybe, maybe, we have a new um, uh, step uh, of uh, uh, the populism. The populists are not anymore in a situation of just to be critics, just to be on the opposition, just to be on uh, the protestation but to demonstrate that they can govern. And really, I think this is a project of Mario, of uh, Georgia Meloni, to demonstrate that uh, the conservative populist, because for me, she, is, she has a mixture of conservative and populist style. And uh, in this sense, she wants to demonstrate that they have the ability, the capacity, the opportunity to govern an important country as Italy. So uh, Eric Zemmour and Marion Maréchal, on ideological point of view, are closer uh, of uh, um, uh, Georgia Meloni than uh, uh, Marine Le Pen. Uh, and you have to remember that they are not in the same group at the European Parliament. And this is quite important because Meloni is the group of the conservative and reformist, uh, while uh, Marine Le Pen in the group of identity and democracy, which is not the same thing. She is, Melanie is more conservative. She is against Islam uh, at the name of, uh, and we uh, told that, uh, of the Christianity. Uh, we have to defend the traditional family and the Christian values. This is not the perspective of Marine Le Pen. This is a perspective of Georgia Meloni and Eric Zemmour. With a difference, Eric Zemmour want to re, uh, con, uh, uh, to, is proposing the new narrative of his story of France. Uh, he does a revision of the history of France. He explained that Pétain saved the Jews, for instance, that Pétain and de Gaulle were together during the Second World War. He insists a lot on the history. Uh, for Marie, for um, uh, Georgia Meloni, she has a strategy to avoid to speak of the past. Okay, fascism is by the past. And why uh, it, is it so necessary to speak always of fascism? She is an anti-anti-fascist, and that is uh, really important in a political strategy. And the migrations, that's the point. She's speaking about hotspots, but nobody understands what's going, what does it mean? But I'm sure that she will, she will try to have this discussion at the European level, to have a coordination of the European policy, to try to avoid the arrival, the uh, arrival 
of migrants uh, coming from the other side of the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And so she used this idea and she's quite, she's very clever. And she said, we have to help Africa. Uh, we cannot remain in this situation. We have to avoid the migration because as Italians, we know what does it mean to be migrant? It's a moment of uh, uh, very complicated. And uh, uh, we think that we have to, uh, uh, to limit uh, the possibility of migration of African uh, uh, citizens. Um, I could say some words, Louise, about what you say, because uh, it's perfectly right. I mean, uh, Marion, um, Georgia Meloni presents herself as a mother, as a woman, and as a Christian. She is against the gender theory. She is against uh, uh, all, uh, she against this idea that there is a relative one and relative two. She explained that the family is a man and a woman, a father and a mother, even if she is not married personally, uh, but she insists a lot on that. And uh, uh, she uh, presents herself as a woman and she insists this morning, it was very interesting in the speech she did uh, in front of the parliament, she did a, a reference to all the main women who had resp political responsibility in Italy. Anti-fascist one, communist one, but also Oriana Falacci, who is the great uh, theorist against Islamization, Islamization of uh, Western Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, on the vote, we know that the vote for Georgia Meloni is more a male vote than a female vote. There is a real gap between the voters. They are more, uh, it's a real male voters uh, and more than female voters. Thank you, Mark. Um, Eric, maybe for... Uh, yes, br briefly on protectionism, and you're right, I, I did not mention that. Uh, first thing to say, Italy is very protectionist. Of course, not in terms of... Uh, the, the, the goods market, because it's not possible. There is a single market. But Italy is protectionist, uh, not only Italy, I would say France and Spain are also protectionist, but this is mostly through regulation, through red tape, and through the banking system. So it's very, very difficult uh, for uh, any uh, foreign bank to operate in Italy. There has been attempts, but there have not been uh, great successes. So the, the, the amount of red tape is some sort of protectionism. Now, is it uh, possible to do more? Yes, I think so. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, in the zeitgeist, uh, protectionism under the banner of, uh, um, you know, sovereignty or uh, not being dependent on other countries is, uh, is something which is very fashionable. So where is it possible? Not on the good markets. <laughs> that is very important, but there is nothing that can be done on the good markets in the internal market but it is possible on services. Services are uh, much uh, more prone to uh, protectionism, especially the financial services, but not only. And in terms of uh, also the ownership of companies, uh, which is very often a bone of contention. Um, and in, in this regard, I, I want to repeat that Italy is not alone. Um, that, that this is something which is shared by uh, I would say most southern countries in Europe. But um, in this regard, it is possible for a government to sound uh, nationalist simply by refusing alliances, such as what you mentioned, Mark, about uh, the, uh, the airline company. An alliance with Air France uh, seems now to be uh, excluded. I would say this is more token you know, than, than uh, important economic decisions. So it's possible. Now, there is another level, which in my view is much more important. At the national level, it could be more protectionist, protectionist but this will be epsilon compared to the current situation. So this will not change things dramatically. Where things could change would be if Italy is able, uh, together with other EU countries, to build a coalition of uh, countries willing to increase the protection of its borders from an economic standpoint. I'm not talking about uh, uh, immigration here. So which countries are candidate? Again, Southern countries. France would be very happy to join such a coalition. Of course, it would not be called, named uh, <laughs> the, the, the protectionist uh, Lega, that, that would have a, a beautiful name, but 
is it politically realistic? Uh, I have my doubts on that. So this is much more on the political analysis side of things. But I have my doubts because protectionism, almost by definition, is a non-cooperative game. So to cooperate with other countries within the same union to promote a protectionist agenda is a very, very tall order. But you know, uh, I cannot exclude that. And in that case, that would really change uh, the economy of the European Union, if that is possible. Thank you. That's a great transition to the coming questions, um, except Mark, if you want to jump in. No, the, uh, I, I saw that there are some uh, questions, but uh, ju just a point, I think uh, uh, Eric said uh, something very interesting because Melanie, uh, during their campaign, uh, insist a lot about this idea, which is very popular in Italy, that the French companies do, this is a quotation, their markets uh, in Italy to buy some Italian companies and some of the most prestigious ones, Gucci and the other ones. Uh, and uh, uh, usually she said, uh, we're going to protect our companies. Uh, but what you say that it could be a possible cooperation of so-called protectionism between France and Italy, that could be a point of convergence uh, yeah. between Macron and Meloni. Uh, it would be a paradox, uh, mm -hmm. but that could be interesting. For the moment when she speaks about sovereignty, she speaks mainly of national sovereignty. She does not speak, for instance, about European sovereignty. And that's the point also, and that was the discourse and the speech she does for the uh, different small uh, companies and small uh, firms uh, in the north of Italy. We're going to protect you. We're going to give you the possibility to develop your business, less rules, more efficiency, and we're going to try to protect you. Is it possible in the world of today? I'm not so sure as you. Mm. And what does the Confindustria uh, think about such an approach? Uh, is, uh, it, is it getting protectionist too? Uh, Aldo Bonomi, which is the chief of the Confindustria this morning, say uh, the speech of Giorgia Meloni is a very good speech. Uh, so because she insists a lot of the culture of the work, la culture du travail. Uh, this is not Sandrine Rousseau. The and, work uh, culture. Uh, the work yeah, culture. the work culture uh, and the job culture. So uh, <laughs> uh, she insists a lot. And for the moment, the position of the Confindustria, and I must say if my information are good and correct, this is a position also of the, uh, of the MEDEF, is to say we have to be with Miloni to go in the good direction. She needs some help, and we're going to help her to change uh, 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 and to go in the good direction. This is quite the uh, non-official position, but I uh, l listen a lot about this kind of attitudes uh, uh, from the MEDEF and from the Confindustria. Mm. So let's return to the question uh, Eric was asking about uh, the possibility of a coalition of countries within the EU, uh, we, which could join hands with um, uh, Meloni's uh, government um, and, and make capture the EU from the inside uh, in the wrong case scenario, in the worst case scenario. So Jacques, Jacques Rupnik is asking, what are the chances of an alliance or convergence with Poland's East and or Orbán's party? They were the first populists in Europe to come to power. Salvini has recently cultivated both. He has been upstaged by Meloni. Can she become the main partner for EE populists? Uh, turn to Mao's question. Yeah. Yes, Jacques, uh, this is a crucial point, uh, uh, as I said, because uh, you're perfectly right. Uh, uh, Georgia Meloni is very close uh, in terms of ideology and politics uh, uh, of uh, um, the Polish and the Hungarian government, again, except about the war in Ukraine uh, with Orban. But Orban is really uh, the reference has been and is always a great ideological reference for Giorgia Meloni and also for Matteo uh, Salvini. So uh, that's the point. Uh, what she's going to do? Uh, is she ready to do an alliance with the Polish and the Hungarian government in Europe? And that would be a real transformation of the balance of power inside uh, of the European Union. Or is she trying to have good relationship with Germany and France, but also uh, with uh, uh, the Polish and the Hungarian? This is a big question. Obviously, uh, the choice of Antonio Tajani as foreign minister 
and the choice of the Minister of European Affairs indicate that she will not go directly in direction of an alliance with uh, Poland and Hungary, uh, because both of them are really pro-European and understand perfectly that it will be a terrible consequence if there is a break of the relationship with Germany and France. And also uh, that will be a pressure, for instance, of the Confindustria, uh, obviously of the different companies, uh, of the different businessmen uh, to remain in a relationship of dialogue uh, with Germany and, uh, uh, um, uh, and France. Uh, but she had also some pressure coming from the uh, uh, the component more radical right inside uh, our party and uh, with some intellectuals. For instance, this morning, a newspaper, um, no, yesterday morning, Monday, La Verita, the truth, which is a, a small newspaper, very radical right oriented, uh, criticized her for the meeting with Emmanuel Macron, saying, be cautious with this man. Uh, you don't have to do immediately this kind of compromise. So she will have to take in account uh, her ideological position, the reality and economic reality and the geopolitical reality. So the, the weight of uh, Germany and France and also the pressure inside uh, her coalition and inside her own party and some ideological intellectuals. And this is a point I would like to uh, uh, underline and to emphasize because it's very important. You have to understand that these people of Bozos of Italy, they were a real small party. They were completely marginalized. They were at 4% in 2018. Now they have 26% of the voters. So they arrive in power and some of them are really ideologically oriented. So they want to apply what they think and what they think has a truth. So that will be a problem for her because she will be between the reality uh, 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 of the complexity of the things and the ideological oriented uh, members of his own, let's say like that, not only coalition, but uh, 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 a party and all the intellectual cause uh, to her. Yeah. Yeah. And one variable that needs to be factored in when you look at this complexity is the financial dependence of Italy vis-a-vis -vis Europe. I don't know, Eric, but the, how can you alienate Macron and the uh, and Schultz when you when you when you are bailed out by the EU potentially. No, that, that's a that's a very fair point. This is one of uh, uh, the constraints I was mentioning to explain that the Italian economic policy uh, has a very very little room for manoeuvre. Um, where uh, things are, are a bit different from what they were before. Uh, the uh, war in Ukraine and the energy crisis. And the difference is that the, the among the big countries, the countries which, is, which uh, will be the, the most badly hit is precisely Germany. Yeah. So to some extent, this is you know, very different. Germany used to, uh, to have the wallet and to bail out countries under the condition of reforms, which has worked very nicely in the case of Spain, for instance. A bit less in the case of Italy, because Italy never had to be officially bailed out. Uh, but now Germany wants to use its money for its own industry and its own consumers. So uh, the, I, I, I don't know exactly how this will turn out. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the, the, it, it is even more riskier to challenge Germany now. Because Germany, I'm afraid, will say, OK, we keep our wallet for ourselves if you do not listen to our conditions, which are structural reforms in the case of Italy, and which in the case of France is likely to be, because at some point this might happen, but this is not the topic today. About no, no, France. but they're interesting anyway, because we are also thinking in terms of scenarios, and this evolution of Germany is affecting the whole of the EU. So to stay in the EU, uh, Mao, uh, the Fougere's question uh, takes us back to this question I asked uh, about the Af North African hotspots project. Uh, who could be um, interested in uh, joining hands with Italy on such a project, if, if, if anybody knows? 
I don't know. Now it's a very good question and I don't have the answer. And I think that we could discuss at Montaigne about that. I mean, the, the specialists of the European uh, uh, integration, uh, uh, what could be the answer at the European level. Um, uh, um, since the beginning of this electoral campaign, um, uh, Georgia Meloni said that on the migrants, uh, there is no possibility to have just a national answer. She has been very uh, direct on that and very clear in saying we have to find a, a, a European policy uh, on migrations. So she repeated that uh, during her speech of this morning, saying we have to find this solution. And she speaks about, uh, she referred to a great businessman who was Enrico Mattei, who had the plan for the development of Italy in the 1950s, just after the Second World War. And she said, we have to do a Mattei plan for Africa. Yes. Uh, uh, that we could say a Marshall Plan uh, for Africa and to try to, uh, uh, to help uh, the development of the country to avoid the migrations. Uh, this is, you know, some words she use. Uh, she speaks about hotspots. She say, OK, we're not going to organize a, a, a naval blockage, a block of the boats. So this is a critique of Matteo Salvini, which he tried to do uh, by the past when he was minister of uh, the inter in interior, and uh, uh, she said, we have to organize these hotspots. How it can be done, I don't have the answer. We'll have to look at it, because if it gives ideas to others, uh, it will be even more important to, to see how it can concretely be implemented. So Aaron uh, has uh, another question that um, is about uh, the party. Uh, given that Mark mentioned Fratelli's mix of economic liberalism and social protection, is there any indication of the class composition of Meloni's voters or of the right center of question in general? Have the brothers of Italy managed to capture working class voters in the same way as other populist parties in Europe? Yes, I'm going to answer. I, I saw that there is also Alberto Martinelli who knows perfectly that, so he will be, uh, he, he will uh, maybe uh, add some elements of answer. Yes, we have many uh, investigations about that, and we know quite perfectly uh, the voters of Meloni. Uh, it has been. It's. We could say that it's a catch-all party, really, for this election. Uh, Georgia Meloni, uh, again, there is a gap between male and female voters, uh, but she's present in all the social categories. Uh, shopkeepers, craftsmen, that's uh, the main category. We always vote for uh, voters of Italy, but in proportion more important than by the past. Uh, but she is also present in the working class, in the popular class, in the employees, in so many uh, uh, public uh, uh, employers. Uh, of the public sector, which is a great surprise, even uh, among the teachers. So uh, it demonstrates the capacity she has to uh, penetrate in these categories, uh, really in all the categories. And uh, uh, there is an important element because traditionally, Bozos of Italy, this small party was present in the south of Italy, in Rome, in some cities of the northeast, in the region of Venezia. Uh, and it's not, not anymore the case. She's really, Brothers of Italy is present in all the country and a little less in the south because there is uh, uh, the competition with Five Star Movement, uh, who is the great defensor of the uh, citizen income that she wants to cancel. Uh, the only categories where is, uh, the party is not present is the population which is uh, living in the center of the cities the population with a high level uh, of life and the people who has a high level of instruction. And this is exactly the population we vote for the center left. Uh, so uh, we have the same things in the majority of the uh, other European countries and especially in France. Uh, and the young people, the young people don't vote for Georgia Meloni, and especially when they have the high level of education. But the only problem is that these young people don't go to vote, uh, or does not don't go so many uh, are not so many uh, who go to vote. So really, this is an important success of Georgia Meloni. She is present in quite all the social categories. Yeah, this is typical of the populist, uh, indeed. Um, Alberto, you, we, you are indeed connected. Uh, as Mark was saying, you know this on the, well, on the palm of your hand. 
So if you want to elaborate, you're most, you're most welcome to elaborate on, on, on what Mike, uh, Mark has just said. Yeah, the floor is yours. You can uh, open your mic and share your views with us. You're muted. Can you unmute yourself? Maybe we have to do that. Maybe uh, Christophe, no. No, I think he is in a position to unmute himself. Can you tell us whether there is any problem? Okay, so we will wait for this manip to take place. What seems to be very interesting, given what you've just said, Mark, is that we wonder whether we are not seeing indeed a, a transformation of the populists. Um, and in fact, you mentioned that in your in your presentation also. Uh, populism becoming a political style for conquering power. Uh, but once in office, the uh, leader of the government falls back on a more traditional, conservative, <laughs> illiberal style of politics and, and, and somewhat try to minimize the uh, police dimension that was not um, useful anymore and even more than that could be really counterproductive. You have to appear responsible, you have to appear uh, reasonable. So uh, the question then is, for the voters, if she dilutes too much her traditional stand, uh, will they consider that she still represents them? But, but you may wait for responding to this question because Alberto is in a position to speak now. And no, I'm great. Can, by the way. <laughs> Alberto, you are unmuted, you can speak. Oh, okay. So you... uh, the, no, the, uh, the problem is that if I activate the audio, the speaking, uh, the connection becomes very unstable. So. But we <laughs> and, hear you very well. So please uh, okay. go ahead. So let's say very, very shortly. Um, I uh, tend to agree with what uh, Mark was saying that uh, uh, Meloni government. Uh, has no interest in rocking the European boat uh, because Italy needs uh, the PNRR and uh, the help of the Union. Uh, what will uh, certainly be stopped is the fact that uh, uh, the conception of the EU uh, of Meloni and Fratelli d'Italia is uh, very close to Marine Le Pen, in the sense that uh, of the uh, Sovereign's Manifesto written by uh, Le Pen last year, last July, not this year, last year in July, and undersigned immediately by Meloni, Salvini, and uh, of course Kaczynski, Urban, and so on. That is, uh, they consider the EU, the Union, not a union, but a confederation. Uh, and a confederation of countries uh, which can cooperate, of course, but uh, do not go a step further. And this uh, big divide remains. So unfortunately, uh, those like me who would like to see a, a greater political union uh, will not be able to count on Italy in the next year until this government is in power. Uh, second, very short comment, uh, um, the fact that uh, of the uh, traditional uh, right-wing uh, politics um, or political programs, I think that Fratelli d'Italia certainly shares uh, completely the conservative values on the family, on the religion. It also shares, of course, a very nationalist attitude. Uh, where he's shaking or uh, not very clear, uncertain, is on the third component, which is uh, uh, economic neoliberalism. Because there, well, 
they are in favor of certain elements of the kind of uh, a neo an economic neoliberal order, but on the other hand, uh, they are very much uh, uh, concerned with uh, the kind of social programs with, of course, strong populist overtones, because they don't want to lose the consensus of uh, well, uh, relevant sectors of uh, the Italian people. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Alberto, did you have did you have any, anything to add? No, no, no. That's just uh, I don't want no, to. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is the first. I, I yeah. want only to add that I enjoy very much both Mark and Eric. And, thank you. Uh, they know it very much. well. So and, the, <laughs> and the first point you made was very well taken. They are not against the EU, but they are for a different EU. Now. Yes, yeah. I'm absolutely sure. I agree completely. I share totally what said Alberto. They are for a confederation uh, of countries inside the European Union. They try to uh, give more importance to the national level, but at the same moment, they say that they want to remain in European Union. So there is a contradiction. There is a tension uh, yeah. uh, which will be problematic yeah. for the future. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, so I, I think we will have more, a, a lot of rhetorics uh, as uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, politicians are, are used to do, and especially, uh, and it's not a critic, Alberto, you know, uh, but uh, with uh, the Italian style, you know, uh, to do a lot of great uh, declarations, the great uh, uh, polemics, but on the reality of the fact, in terms of matter of fact, uh, uh, I think that we maybe they will be very limited to change completely the orientation of the European Union. But it's true, and in the program of Borsas of Italy, it's clearly indicated that the national law is superior, preeminent to the yeah. European yeah. law, exactly on the Polish position. So that means, for instance, that they could vote against the sanction against Poland and Hungary. And Borsas of Italy and League at the European Parliament refused and reject the declaration of the majority of the parliament saying that no, now uh, uh, Hungary is a, an autocratic electoral system, which means it's not anymore a democracy. And what has been the explanation of this vote by Georgia Meloni? No, Hungary is a democracy because they vote. Uh, uh, and that's a point we discussed with Christophe in other sessions, uh, the criteria of democracy for them is just the fact that they vote. Uh, not uh, the right. respect uh, of the rule of law. So that's a, a real element of... And not the liberal component of the right. Exactly. Of they are democratic, but not liberal. Absolutely. Right. Uh, and that will be an important point. On what you say, Christophe, uh, I think it's another tension because from one part, they present themselves, uh, uh, and that has been the great uh, ability uh, Georgia and Meloni's ability during the electoral campaign and always now, and I must say that the majority of the uh, Italian politicians, but also of the researcher, of the journalist, maybe underestimate the intelligence of Georgia Meloni. She is very clever, very intelligent, and uh, she presented as a reasonable person, uh, as a reasonable leader, and uh, uh, maybe a part of the voters would say, but uh, now you are in power, you have to do what you uh, promise, uh, and especially for this national feeling uh, which exists in Italy, and I insist on that point because uh, many of you are French people. Uh, in 2019, I did a poll uh, for the dialogue, uh, French uh, and Italian dialogue for Europe that Sciences Po and Louis University have created with the support of uh, uh, Ambrosetti Think Tank. And in this poll, uh, we had a very uh, uh, interesting result because 60% of the French people say that they have sympathy for Italy and Italians, but we had 40% of Italians who say that they have antipathy for France and French people. And when I see some of, of the declarations of uh, some people of left and this incredible Sandrine Rousseau after uh, uh, the meeting between Macron and Meloni, who say how we can uh, have a meeting with a fascist. Again, in Italy, it's perceived as a French give lessons to Italy. This is a French arrogance. So we have to be very cautious on that. But 
I, I, what I don't know, but maybe Alberto knows that, uh, but I asked Wilbo Diamanti to do a, a, a poll on that. It's how many among the 26% of the voters of Meloni agree on their position on the traditional family and on the Christian values. I'm not so sure that all of them uh, are completely in agreement, in adhesion, in uh, agree and share this position. I'm not so sure. But what I am, what we know that the majority of the voters, of the Italian voters, vote for, uh, for social reason. And that's yes. exactly the point of Eric. What does what she's able to do in terms of social protection? Uh, because the majority of the Italians say our priority is the job market to have access to the job, to have social protection, and to have a cap for the price of energy, gas, and uh, uh, petrol. So what can she do on that, Eric? Uh, is, he, is she able to uh, be at the level of the great social expectation of a population who is was also who is afraid with the next winter uh, because maybe the Italians are going to be in very bad situation for the dependence uh, of the energy. What can she do, really, in your opinion? Well, Eric, that, that's, that's a question. That's a question of uh, can, national spending. I, I, I can't hear. Yes. Uh, you Alberto, hear me? Alberto, could you could you mute yourself and maybe you will hear more. On a, on a national level, of course, it's always, and that will be in the budget. They will be spending to protect the purchasing power of consumers. Uh, but there will be less efforts in Italy than in Germany or in France, because there is less room for manoeuvre because of the size of the debt and the level of interest rates. So that, that might you know, generate some frustration. Why are we... Uh, why is there such an uneven treatment of citizens in the European Union? Now, there is the other level, which is uh, at the European Union level. So these are the negotiations on, uh, uh, on the price cap for natural gas, for, for fossil gas. And, and here, uh, there is no change. The fact that there is a new Italian government does not change the negotiations. Uh, the, the, the positions of... Uh, it, it's. It's basically a, a, a great bargaining between France and Germany. Uh, so there will be some protection coming from the European Union level. Uh, funds coming from the EU level uh, allocated to all the countries which are suffering from the rise in gas prices, that will be limited, but Italy would benefit more than other countries because it is more exposed. And again, at the national level, the limits uh, will be met and that, that, that might be a bit painful for the next elections. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Eric. And, and, and Jack Lakopnik in, in the chat says, 2000, either Schussel government in Australia, ostracized and vilified in EU. Today, Meloni plus Salvoni plus Berlusconi seen as the new normal. Yes, times have changed for sure in the course of the last 20 years. A very last question very brief from my side, Mark. Uh, populists are very good at transcending all cleavages, all cleavages. And, and, and as I said, they have, uh, in this time, she has this time been able to, um, well, get votes across the class structure. What about geography? You said she has made a lot of progress in the North. Uh, has, has, has populism erased electoral geography? to a large extent, besides the urban versus rural uh, line of cleavage that you mentioned, in terms of regional politics. Yes, no, you're right. Uh, uh, the uh, important element, which is completely new, is the progression of Bozos of Italy in the north of the country. Uh, because it was considered as a marginal party, as a, uh, a, a party which is very close to the state by fascist tradition, you know, a strong state, uh, and not uh, open to uh, possibilities of uh, 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 liberalism, let's say like that to be very quick. Uh, and, and this is a, a really important change. She is, the, uh, she is now the first party, it's not anymore the league, 
in the northern country. And that's the reason why Salvini is absolutely furious. Uh, and this morning he, he, he say uh, many things about all the policy of the government, not only on his ministry. And it's going to be a permanent barrier for, for him. Uh, in terms of relationship between small cities, rural zone, and the urban center, it's exactly in all the countries. Georgia Meloni is very strong in small, uh, small cities, a rural zone, uh, and not in the center of the great agglomeration, the great cities. Uh, this is a, a great opposition. And again, in the voters, we see a big difference. Uh, uh, the voters of Georgia Meloni have a low level of instruction. Uh, why the electors of the Democratic Party, for instance, are people who have the level of master and so on. So this is, you know, uh, always what we see in quite all European countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you, Mark and Eric. It was really enlightening. And uh, we could uh, now, uh, we can now um, prepare ourselves for the next step and we'll review the situation uh, on a regular basis. Um, next webinar, the next webinar of our observatory populism will be devoted to the midterm elections in the US on the 10th of November. Cass Mudder will explain us the day after the results of these uh, midterm elections. Um, so we will, of course, send invitations and you'll be uh, able to uh, register for being connected on time. Have a great evening and thank you for sharing this moment with us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.